Good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Walter Isaacson of the Aspen Institute, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the sixth annual presentation of the Preston Robert Tisch Awards. It's an award in civic leadership named after a person who helped define what civic leadership should be about. And it's part of a larger series of things that the Aspen Institute does here in New York, thanks to Laurie Tisch and others, which is a series uh, about leadership, public service, and philanthropy. Uh, it's uh, something we've had many great speakers, but it always culminates uh, with the Tisch Award. Prior recipients of this award have been uh, Wenton Marsalis, uh, Billie Jean King, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, and Congressman John Lewis. Uh, I can think of nobody who deserves more to be in that tradition, although we'll talk about it later, but this is my personal note, than Darren. Darren and I go way back, not as far as the Abyssinian Baptist Church, which some people here keep saying, I remember you when, and I was working in the basement with you there. But certainly, uh, exactly uh, 10 years ago, when the planning process for New Orleans couldn't work, we knew one place to go, and that was talking to you and Judy, and instantly uh, the s city of New Orleans started coming back. You've done a whole lot more, but that's my little personal thank you for that, Darren. Uh, Bob Tisch made an indelible legacy, uh, had an indelible uh, impact on society, in business, in sports, in public service, and in philanthropy. He built the Lowe's Corporation with his brother Larry. He served as Postmaster General, and in partnership with Wellington Mara and the Mara family, he co-owned the New York Giants. Go Giants. But it was his concern for people and community that will be most remembered. This year's recipient carries on that tradition of community involvement, concern for people seeking ways to improve the lives and futures of people and communities around the world. To present this year's award and to introduce a recipient, it's a good friend of Darren's, a great friend and board member of the Aspen Institute, Laurie Tisch. Bob's daughter and the guiding light of this series. She carries on the family uh, tradition of caring and community involvement. Wait, we even have a video before you get to come up, so <laughs> keep your seat. This is why I'm vamping while people come and find their seats because of the traffic being so bad. She and her brothers, Stephen and Jonathan, and Jonathan's wife, Lizzie, are generous supporters of this series and the Institute. In short, she's the type of person who understands the importance of involvement in community. Before either turning the program over to her or allowing her to storm the stage, as she's tried to do, let me show you a brief video about the remarkable group of individuals who've been recipients of this award. So if I, let's see, this is four, one, two, three, four on top of that. He is on a mission to demonstrate the power of art to heal to inspire, to teach, and to bring us together as individuals. The arts in general provide us with uh, an understanding of why we are alive. Tonight what we want to celebrate is your unending commitment to inspiring others to focus on social equality both on and off the court. And I think that's why history is so important. I try to explain that. I think I try to tell young people particularly the more you know about history, the more you know about yourself. And uh, because you have to know how we got there and then how do you want to shape the future. Among the country's most successful restaurateurs, more important than successful, he's a model for how others want to run their business. But until you actually bear witness to, to feel what the people who you're trying to help are feeling, you're not going to be empathetic enough to, to really know what to do. Mr. Mayor, I know you receive a lot of awards, but we think this one is quite special. If my father was still alive today, this is what we think he'd say. Congratulations, Mike. Today you are an honorary Tish. Welcome to the family. The best ways out of poverty is a job. So as Lori talked about getting jobs, you have to go and create jobs. And you have to create jobs that match the skill sets of those who need the jobs, not the skill sets of people who you might attract. You have to go and attract the best and the brightest from around the world. The award is to those who have made a difference in their communities. The congressman has done so much more than his community. His community is the U.S. His community is the world. Never ever give up. You must never ever give in. 
Never become bitter. Be hopeful. Be optimistic. And look to the future. Uh, it is an exemplary family, and they really made an enormous difference in the city and in the country. Our friend, Laurie Tesh. Finally. <laughs> um, thank you, Walter, and good evening to everybody. And of course, a big thanks to Jamie Miller and the entire um, staff who worked on this at the Aspen Institute. As always, you were spectacular. Thanks also to MoMA's Glenn Lowry and their board and staff for hosting this event. Um, and of course, to Walter, who you'll hear from ag again. Um, MoMA is such a special institution to my family, um, to my late father, and to my mother, who has served as a trustee for decades and decades, and to my cousin Alice Tish, who is also here, who is a trustee, and to Darren as well. So. A little aside, I'm co-chair of the Whitney Museum, but <laughs> and Adam Weinberg is here too, but um, <laughs> just like Darren, we love all culture. <laughs> so I'd also like to recognize my brothers, Steve and John, and my sister-in-law, Lizzie, who have also been full partners in developing this wonderful program. Um, and also my children, who are on their way, um, unfortunately too old to yell at for being late. Um, but my children, um, Emily Tish Sussman and Carolyn uh, Tish Blodgett, who both play active roles in my foundation and who also I have such admiration for as I watch them juggle their very busy careers, family life, and philanthropy. And from the time they were very, very young, um, philanthropy and volunteerism has always been a part of their lives as well. And I really credit that role model to both of my parents and especially to watching my father and how he acted throughout his life. So we're very, very thrilled that you're all able to join us today for the presentation of the Aspen Institute's sixth annual Preston Robert Tisch Award in Civic Leadership. My family and I created this award in the speaker series, Conversations with Great Leaders, as a meaningful way to honor our father's legacy through active discussion of the most pressing issues affecting the nation, the region, and our city. The award is presented to an individual who has made a positive impact on his or her community and embodies my father's ideal of value-based leadership. As you saw in the video, our past five honorees have been nothing short of rock stars, both in their fields as well as in their philanthropy and visions for a better world. Therefore, it was important and somewhat daunting for me and my family to recognize someone in year six who would not only be worthy of this award and all it stands for, but also someone who would fit in with the most, this most impressive and illustrious crowd. Not an easy task indeed. We discussed several names and then although many were really stellar, nobody seemed quite right to me. Then over the summer, I was at the Whitney Museum, had to get that in, <laughs> one Saturday afternoon with my executive director, Rick Lofglass, and we were meeting to review the really exciting and innovative education programs with the education director. And I asked her if she could think of anyone who embodied the many varied ca characteristics needed for this award. We talked about it a little bit, and then we moved on to talk about the dilemma and complexities of saving Detroit especially the Detroit Institute of Arts. And as the saying goes, a light bulb went off. Before contacting Darren, I ran the idea past my family and the leadership of the Aspen Institute, all of whom agreed, not only was Darren the right person to receive this award, but there truly was nobody better or more deserving. So why Darren? Although there are many ways in which my father and Darren differ, differ there are even more examples in ways in which they're similar. Although my father was not born in a Louisiana, Louisiana charity hospital, he and his brother Larry did have something of a challenging childhood 
as they often move from one Brooklyn residence to another to take full advantage of the last month's free rent on a year's lease. And <laughs> And it's true. And Bob was certainly not a Dallas Cowboy fan, although I have to say, sorry for the Washington p folks here, but we were all Dallas Cowboy fans last night when the Redskins played Dallas. Um, <laughs> and I suspect Darren was a, was a Cowboys fan, hopefully not still, um, while he was attending the University of Texas on a Pell Grant, obtaining undergraduate degrees in government and speech communication, and then a JD from the law school. Um, nor did my father have the aesthetic sense um, and understand, great understanding of the arts and wonderful eye that Darren had. As a matter of fact, I remember years ago when my father was in something with, of an argument with my brother who was redecorating one of the hotels and wanted some fabric on the chairs, um, more than muslin, I think. And my father said, the only decoration I want to see on those chairs are behinds. <laughs> Actually, that's not exactly how he put it, but, <laughs> but this is a fancy museum, so <laughs> at the Whitney downtown, I would say what he really said. <laughs> but they both shared a love and devotion of their cities to improving, to improving the lives of those less fortunate and to their friends and families as evidenced by the, by the packed crowd here tonight. My father grew up understanding the importance of a prosperous, inclusive city, and therefore helped every New York City mayor since the 1960s. Bob's last project was with Mayor Giuliani, chairing the nonprofit called Public-Private Initiatives, which raised money for city initiatives and was the predecessor to today's, today's Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City which we at the Illumination Fund are still very happy and proud to support. Like my father, Darren has been a tireless champion of urban renewal, first at the Abyssinian Development Corporation, re revitalizing Harlem, and then at the Rockefeller Foundation, leading a post-Katrina recovery program in the South, and now at the Ford Foundation, championing, championing, championing <laughs> Detroit's grand bargain, which literally saved this really important and great city. Like many here tonight, I could go on and on with both Darren and Bob's stories, but it's time to hear from Walter and our most distinguished and beloved honoree. Darren, in honor of your, your leadership in philanthropy, my family and I are pleased to present you with the 2015 Preston Robert Tisch Award in Civic Leadership. And yes, like Meyer, Mayor Mike and the past awardees, you too are an honorary member of the Tisch family, provided you're not still a Cowboys fan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just want to say how deeply honored and grateful I am, Lori, to you and Jonathan and Steve and your incomparable mother for this remarkable award that I don't feel deserving of. Bob Tisch was an icon. He was a man of extraordinary commitment to this city. And he loved his country, and he loved his family, as you know. And he set a new standard in so many ways for philanthropy and civic leadership in a very old-fashioned way. We don't see many CEOs today who really are rooted in their community and are committed to the betterment of the people who live and the places where they make their fortunes. And he stood for all of that. I know that he supported your mother at a time when she stepped forward at the beginning of the AIDS crisis, when so many people were dying and so many privileged people stood back. 
And Joan Tish stepped forward, not only with her resources, but with her human power and capacity for love and fellowship. And your father stood behind her when there were other prominent men who told their wives to stay away from their gay friends at the beginning of this horrible crisis. And so I'm just deeply honored and profoundly moved that you would deem me worthy of this award on this special occasion. And to you and your brothers and your cousins and all of the Tisch family, I'm deeply indebted and very grateful um, and so appreciative of this honor. So thank you, Lori. Let me start with a biographer's question. How did uh, growing, uh, you were born in Lafayette, Louisiana, in the Charity Hospital, and grew up in Goose Creek, Texas. How did your life story affect what you're doing now? Well, I think my life story has affected me because uh, it, it, it helps to keep me grounded. Mm -hmm. And I think I um, have a sense of empathy, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and I, um, I understand um, what it feels like to live life on the margins and to be excluded and to be invisible. And now I'm quite visible. <laughs> and I understand the difference. And, and so I think in some ways, um, having a kind of position that uh, creates an artificiality uh, around me is something that um, I'm constantly uh, fighting against and, and um, challenging. Mm -hmm. you come, it's a long line of uh, people from so many different backgrounds who've been head of the Ford Foundation, from Mac Bundy to the yeah. present, uh, at least in our lifetime. How do you see yourself in that tradition? Well, I think, I mean, I'm, I have been preceded by really remarkable people, and, and I don't think I measure up. Quite honestly, um, neither did I, Matt I think I think I um, <laughs> I think in some ways I um, am probably certainly the first president uh, who who sort of with my background and um, uh, who when you think about the real challenges that the Ford Foundation seeks to address in society can really relate to those challenges on a, on a granular level. But you changed the way uh, you define those challenges. And your letter this year was just astonishing. It really made great Thank ripple you. effects. And you talked both about the new gospel of wealth and focus on the inequality right. issue. Well, I mean, think inequality for me is a result. I mean, our deciding to focus on inequality is in some ways a result of our focus on our mission and our vision, which I think we have to be, uh, the job of a leader in part is to uh, craft a, a vision that people are motivated by and people find coherent. Mm -hmm. And so the vision of the Ford Foundation is for a more just and fair and peaceful world. Um, I believe the greatest threat to that vision is inequality. And so using that as a lens, a prism through which we organize our work, and as a foundation that works around the world, we have been challenged to find coherence. And I think it's been a fair critique of the Ford Foundation that some have said, historically, we've kind of been all over the place, if you will. All over the map. Um, and to have one unifying organizing idea around which we do all of our work has brought more coherence to our work and I think brought more consistency across the 11 offices. And in fact, inequality is the one consistent theme. So whether you're in our Beijing office or our Delhi office or our Rio office or our Lagos office or in New York, the thing when you speak to people that they feel more than anything is an increasing inequality in their society. And you see it manifest. I saw it when I was 
earlier this year, last year, in Lagos, and was in the middle of the largest slum in Africa on this lagoon, in, in, and just with abject, horrific conditions. And in Lagos, of course, as I later learned from a, a colleague in marketing, LVMH does the most per capita business in the world, in Lagos. And the fact that there are more luxury goods sold in that African city and more poverty, that juxtaposition is really a profound manifestation of inequality. But we have it right here in our backyard as well. What do you think are the causes of growing inequality? Well, I think there are two dimensions to it. I mean, economists will tell you that there are a number of inputs, that there is no one thing. So we understand that globalization, that technology, um, um, education, uh, there, there are a number of inputs. I think there are also a number of less quantifiable but pernicious inputs, like cultural narratives. So there are cultural narratives that in some way justify why some of us are privileged and others are not. And again, wherever you are in the world, you find those narratives. So for example, in India, if you are among many privileged people in India, particularly people of the upper caste, it's not uncommon to hear someone say that Dalits, the lower caste, are supposed to be poor. I mean, that it's actually in polite company. You wouldn't be rebuked if you made that comment. Uh, because culturally, that really has been a, a very normative part of the narrative of culture in India, just as in America. We have cultural narratives about black people, about poor people. Poor people make bad choices, and that's why they're poor. I mean, we have narratives. And those narratives, in some ways, compound our privilege and compound the disadvantage of others. And over generations, what starts to happen is what's happening in America today, which is that there is this sort of accreted privilege of some and this accreted disadvantage of others. And the implication for our society is the unraveling, in many ways, of, of, of our society. Um, and, and, and so that's why I worry so much about inequality in America today. When you were talking about inequality at the summit that the Aspen Institute did in Washington a few weeks ago, you said it also requires moving away from a mindset of charity to one of justice. Uh, how, would, how are you doing that? Well, I said, what I said at, in Washington was that it, it, we, need to move from, we need to move from a paradigm of generosity to a paradigm of justice. And what I meant by that was generosity is what those of us who are privileged and who can write a check do. And we feel good about being able to do that. And then we go on our lives. Justice requires that we not simply say, let me write a check to, this, to the homeless shelter. Let's really interrogate why there are so many homeless people. Why do we live in a society that produces this much, much homelessness? And what are the structural underpinnings that seemingly produce and reproduce bad outcomes for certain people? And so I'm interested in those structural, mm -hmm. the systemic. So why do we have so many black men in prison? Is it simply because black men are more pathologically inclined to be criminals? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a question. Or is there something systemic about our criminal justice system that renders bad outcomes for black men who are in that system. I'm just 
I think we have to engage in that conversation if we are really to make progress in this society. And, and that's what I meant about moving from generosity, because I think generosity lets people like me and you off the hook, because we get to feel good about ourselves, because we're generous, and we don't engage in the harder questions. Mm -hmm. How does that fit in with the new gospel of wealth that you've been describing? Well, I think when I wrote that essay, what I was in some ways um, seeking to do was to offer admiration for Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller, because in many ways, they were radicals. I mean, they were, um, I mean, when John D. Rockefeller gave money for what was then called Negro education, there were a lot of his, um, his contemporaries who did not support his doing that. Um, and there were a lot of people who didn't necessarily feel that it was a good idea for Andrew Carnegie to build these libraries everywhere because there were privileged, powerful people who benefited from the exclusion of others. And we've seen that throughout our history. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded right. of it because I saw with you yeah. Hamilton. Right. And you remember when we, in the line, when in the cabinet meeting, when Thomas Jefferson is lecturing Andrew Hamilton, and he's doing that rap, and he says, Jefferson says, we don't want to buy into your monetary system because you New Yorkers are just about moving money around. Mm -hmm. We in the South, we plant things, we make things, and our debts are paid. And of course, Hamilton, the New Yorker, retorts, well, of course your debts are paid because we know who's doing the planting. Right. And what Hamilton was saying to Jefferson was, you Southerners are lecturing me about morality, about all of the things that Jefferson had just lectured him about. And he said, your entire economy is based on a system of enslavement. And you have profited from the really subjugation and exploitation of other people. And I am interested in today, have we become democratic enough where it is not necessary to feel that we need to exclude or exploit in order to be prosperous? And I think that is a core fundamental question for our democracy today. Speaking of uh, Hamilton, it really showed how art helps us wrestle with yes. things. Yes. And of course, you did that too when you stepped in with the uh, Institute in Detroit, the Detroit Institute of Art. Tell us how art helps inform what you think you know, the move to justice should be. And in particular, tell us the story of Detroit, what you did and why you did it. Well, it wasn't me, so we'll I should give, just yeah, say but you're that. Getting the award it was a tonight. big group. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, so I think the role of art in your life. So when I was a little boy, before I lived in that little town, Goose Creek, and I lived in Ames. We lived in Ames, Texas. Yeah. And, and we lived in this very sweet little, uh, my partner, David, who is out there, calls it you know, this little vernacular uh, house. I called it a shack. And <laughs> I hope it has a plaque on it now, it, it, like no, a it historical it's, designation. It's torn down on that little dirt <laughs> road. But my grandmother was the maid for this this well And she was family. raising you, right? Well, no, my mother was, was raising yeah. me, but my grandmother I would I would see big what yeah. called her big I would see big every two or three weeks. Oh. And she started to bring me books and mm. magazines from this family's house. And so she'd bring she'd bring shelter magazines, mm. she'd bring books, she'd bring um, art things, she'd bring all sorts just things that they threw away. And those brown paper bags became sort of my treasures. And, and I um, was so, uh, I became so entranced through the pages of worlds, a world that was so far removed from my world. And I was able to imagine things 
and, um, and construct in my mind things that were very different than the environment I was in. And, and it was really, that was my beginning of, of interest in, in the arts. And then when I went to college, I was very involved in various artistic endeavors. And, and on and on, for me, it's always been um, this, this outlet. And then, of course, with David, who is nonstop art, it's just all around me. Never. And so in Detroit, I think I had been president for three months, and I got a call from the chief bankruptcy judge there, and he said the city, um, you know, Detroit is in this unprecedented um, bankruptcy, and the challenge is, of course, the city in this quirk owns the museum and the collection because at the beginning in the old days, the city fathers deemed that the, the, the city would own it. I mean, it was a very different city then. Um, and of course, they couldn't pay the debt on um, the uh, retirees' pension fund. And so because the court was obligated to designate um, it, the assets of the debtor, I mean, like everything, their real estate, their equipment, the yeah. art, all was to, yeah. be, um, was to be assessed and valued and potentially auctioned off. So we came up with a plan, um, we being, meaning the judge and myself and the leaders of a dozen other um, foundations, um, and then the, go the governor ultimately and the DIA board to raise um, $850 million. Um, we, the foundations um, agreed to do half of that, Ford um, $125 million of, of our 400, and, and we were able to ultimately pretty quickly um, and my role was the judge appointed me the sort of chair of the foundation groups. And so my role was really just to raise the money and uh, to, to, to get us all on board and aligned um, quickly. But why? Because Detroit matters. Because Detroit, Detroit is... But I mean, why save the art museum first? If you had eight hundred and fifty million dollars, well, it for wasn't Detroit. just saving the art museum. I mean, I, I wrote about this a couple of occasions because it became all about the art. It actually was just as much about um, the dignity of the retirees. Right. I mean, these were municipal employees. On average, there was um, about eighteen hundred dollars a month in their pension. And they lived, for the most part, off of that and their Social Security. And so the fact that their pensions could be wiped out could mean really abject poverty for some of them. And so to me, that was as important as the art. The fact that these people were, were being simply discarded and the contracts with them were being abrogated when they needed to be honored. And so it was, it was both. And, and I think we were able to accomplish that and I never I never not talk about Detroit when given an opportunity because it is the iconic American city mm -hmm. and it is it has all of the things that make America great and it has all the things that confound you about this country and it's all right there and it is a remarkable mm -hmm. city and if you haven't been, go to Detroit. It is an amazing city. And it's actually coming back now. It is coming back I mean, in I, part because so yeah, many people are moving right. to Detroit because you can buy a 3,000 square foot amazing house, great architecture on a wonderful piece of land for $80,000. But they're also moving back into the city. And in, in the in, city, in the core. In the core, you can buy that same house for $10,000. Yeah, right. I mean, no, seriously. I mean, there are literally, in some of the homes of the executives in the old days, before the executives moved to Gross Point and, mm -hmm. and Bloomfield Hills, they lived in these, these, these enclaves in the city. You can buy houses that are like houses in Scarsdale and Larchmont and Greenwich for like $70,000. It's just, it is amazing. And you understand why so many people are moving there. Mm -hmm. And but so what's the lesson of how Detroit came back? Because it's more than just cheap housing. It's a creativity. It's the, a, less, the, the lesson is what this award is about. It's about leadership. Mm -hmm. 
Detroit, Detroit has been disserved by leaders for so long. It is, it has, it, it allows people like me who think it is a good thing and celebrate when, for example, <laughs> Detroit elected its first African-American mayor. Mm -hmm. But race doesn't trump excellence. Mm -hmm. And the mayors in recent years in Detroit um, have not been excellent mayors. Um, they've been pretty awful mayors. And um, they have not served the city's interests well. And I, I mean, it's, there's no hyperbole. The last one's in jail. And, and so, um, you know, this is a really big issue in a lot of our cities. And in Detroit, you know, they, there is an amazing mayor. My, uh, mayor mm -hmm. Duggan is yep. phenomenal. He is phenomenal. And no one thought in Detroit that a white man could be elected mayor. Because race is so profound in that city and in that region a lens for everyone, and yet he was overwhelmingly elected. And I'm sure he will be again. He's an amazing mayor. And he, like any great mayor, is focused on the right things. He's focused on service, mm -hmm. on fiscal responsibility, on diversity and inclusion, and on bringing great people to City Hall. And he's, he's doing all of that. Mm -hmm. Well, it is indeed ties right into what we're doing tonight in honoring you for your great leadership because it does show that leadership matters. Let me open it up for a few questions before we go on off, so please don't be shy. And uh, uh, We have in the front. Oh, all right, there. right there. Hi, Peter. Yeah. I'm, I'm a Detroiter. Um, yeah. And um, it's great to see you and, and to celebrate you tonight. Uh, Darren, but in fairness to Dave Bing, I just want to say it's not the last mayor who's in jail. Oh, it's the mayor you. before it. Thank mm -hmm. you. It's not the last one. Thank you. It's not there. Is that, uh, thank uh, you. Yeah. Yes, sir, in the middle for our mic runners. I'm sorry, was there a question here, too? No? Okay, yeah, there. Hi, Darren Gideon Stein. Um, Hi, Gideon. Hey, Gideon. Hi, Gideon. Hey, guys. The lights do, are in our eyes, we can't uh, see. Do, do you have a sense as to how Veronica Conforme is doing with uh, the EAA in Detroit? Um, and are, is Ford going to be focused on helping educational initiatives uh, within the city as well? So, um, so yes, I think um, um, we have been and will continue to be uh, focused on um, the, the system there, not a particular charter school or a particular um, bespoke program, because I think we really do have to address the systemic issues in Detroit. And, um, and it's been a major part of our commitment to the city, and it will continue to be. Um, I really can't opine on whether um, particular leadership um, is doing a great job or not. Um, I will say that the reports that I get are encouraging, but we have a very long way to go, as you know, in Detroit with what's happened um, with the state and, um, and with the tension between the city and the state leaders um, around education. Um, but the good news is, the, um, I think there is a, a growing consensus among local leaders and the governor and the other, the key players there to really get on the right side of history um, in Detroit with, in terms of education. Um, it, it, is, it is a tale of two cities uh, when you look at the education system in, in Detroit and the system in the surrounding communities. What, what can we do to reform education? And the fact that we have a two-tiered school system, I saw you talking to Cammie Anderson a moment ago, that we have a two-tiered school system 
that seems to be, if you ask me, what's the one primary cause of inequality. It's the fact that we've gone from schools that served everybody to having a two-tiered school system, two track. There is no single answer of what do we do to solve our challenge of education, public education. Um, because I think the, if, if, we, if we examine the reasons why things have deteriorated, those inputs are really complex. But they really intersect around issues of race and class mm -hmm. and of really hard truths that we have a very difficult time engaging with in this country. And with the reality that every parent, no matter what your station in life, wants the best for their child mm -hmm. and doesn't want their child to be a guinea pig or to be uh, a lab rat for some experiment, mm -hmm. um, but wants their child to have an excellent, safe, educational environment in which to learn. And so putting the system back together requires that we really um, examine, do we really feel it's possible to have an education system, a public education system that serves all? Or are we going towards, well, we are going towards. The question is, do we wish to, mm -hmm. to make permanent what you have in other unequal countries, which is parallel systems? So we can travel to other, and I do, to other parts of the world. And you, you see in what we used to unpolitically correct call third world countries, you see those parallel systems. You see. You go to a country, any, I mean, you go to, to Brazil, you go to Argentina, you go to Nigeria, and you see a system that serves, a private system that serves the wealthy, the elite, and then you see another system that serves the poor, um, ethnic minorities, et cetera. And those parallel systems exist side by side, and, and they produce and reproduce. And we're creating that here. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you go to... Yeah. to unintentionally. Or, I mean... I'm not sure unintentionally. I mean, I would say... But we did not make a policy decision. Let's go from what we had in the 1890s, which is the concept of universal and free high schools that would try to serve everybody, to let's move to the system that uh, you've described. Well, we didn't, Walter. We didn't in the 1890s. Right. agree that we wanted a system that served everyone. That's we said true. we wanted a system that served some, mm -hmm. and that, so my grandfather, who had a third grade education, and who uh, went to public schools in a small town in East Texas, but in those schools, the schools for blacks ended in the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Because at, after the sixth grade, you picked cotton, or you worked, and, and so the system, the public school system, really never fully embraced um, his education and his generation's education. And, and subsequent to that, when it did, we know it was a separate mm -hmm. uh, system that was clearly unequal. And I think when the efforts then were advanced to actually begin to equalize Certainly what we saw in the South, where you and I are from, was a full throttle rejection of that. And I would say that there was a pretty concerted effort by uh, primarily whites and people who could leave the public system. Mm -hmm. And so as you know, when we go home now, when you go, well, the worst case, I mean, when you go to Mississippi, and you literally just see I mean, it is like yep. a developing, I mean, you see parallel systems. parallel systems. I mean, in any, from Jackson to Tupelo, in any town you go oh, yeah. to, you see the public school system, which is all black, and then you see all these Christian academies. Mm -hmm. And there's one's 
St. John Christian Academy, the other St. Bartholomew mm-hmm. Christian Academy, and the, other, and, and the Christian Academies are where all the whites are, and the public mm-hmm. school is where blacks are. Mm-hmm. And that's consistent now across the South. Yeah. And, and so we have, in some ways, began to really mirror what we see in other parts of the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're right. It was policy decisions and probably conscious ones but we never had a national referendum of saying to ourselves morally, do we want parallel systems? And we probably right. need to have that discussion That's now. Right. That's, I think you're right. Uh, yeah, back there. And, um, yeah. Was that right? Yeah. Um, just wondering, so of all you've seen, all you've experienced, all you're trying to tackle in your work, how do you personally and as a leader, because I think they're separate sometimes, re- maintain optimism? Is it the progress? Is it, you know people you surround yourself with? What, what are the sort of approaches mm-hmm. you take? Well, I think the first thing is, is to hire people who are smarter than you. Um, I, all the people who work with me are so much smarter than me. Mm-hmm. And, um, and my job is to create an environment that stimulates and motivates and excites them and give them a lot of run room and not micromanage them. And to, um, I think it's very hard today for leaders to really be authentic. I mean, I was having a conversation with the CEO of a major Fortune 500 company who was a friend of mine, and we were, I, you know, I, I said to them as I can, I said, you know, this annual report of yours is just awful. I mean, <laughs> who wrote your letter? And, and, and I, this is not even your voice. And, and they said, well, of course it's not my voice, because by the time I went from my desk to the printer, the lawyers marked it up, the communications people marked it up, my speechwriter marked it up. I mean, she just went through all the various people who marked it up and said, and what you got is what, you know, well, because my lawyer didn't want me to say that because mm-hmm. An analyst on Wall Street might not like it, or the SEC might. I mean, and there was just all of these reasons why. And it just reminds me of how hard it is to, to have a voice. If you're a real authentic and be who you are voice today, if you're leading any, whether it's MoMA or the Whitney or the Ford Foundation or a major company, because we're all so, we're all so risk averse and concerned with mm-hmm. offending <laughs> or saying something um, that, that might sound stupid or might sound ignorant or might sound politically incorrect. Or, and so we just seek to be safe. And I, I would have a really hard time with that. And, and I think I, you know, even during the, you know, during the recruiting process <laughs> with, the, with the four trustees and, People would, they, they said at one point, so what kind of president would you be, Darren? And what, you know? And I said, you know, I, I would have to be me. I mean, you really wouldn't want to hire me and not have it be me and have it be somebody else. <laughs> right. and, so, and so you're going to get me, me, meaning, you know, I'm Darren, I'm gay, I'm black, I'm from the South, I talk in a certain way, I have a, I have a lived experience, I have biases as a result of that, I, I, all of those things. Like, you're going to get all of that if, if, like, you make me president. <laughs> and and I, I just feel like you have to do that. And, and that's, you know, I mean, that's the only way I know how to be. And, and what keeps me optimistic is that I get to be me, and so I don't feel like a lot of people, I think a lot of people who are CEOs and presidents of things feel like they're in a box. I mean, they feel like every day they're, like, walking on eggshells. I really don't feel like I'm walking in eggshells <laughs> at all. I mean, I, I mean, I don't think I'm, uh, I, I'm inconsiderate or, or hopefully say just stupid things. But you know, I get to do things um, that probably a lot of presidents don't. And you certainly, when you wrote that letter this year, you didn't put it through a whole long vetting process because <laughs> it is your voice. It is really cool. People Thank should you. read it. Yes. Well, let me go the way back because I feel. A little bit guilty on the way back. We'll do a couple more. Did you? What? Okay. Uh, my name's Brian Burt. Uh, just uh, wondered, um, 
if you if we did tackle this inequality problem and you saw growth in the upper end and the lower end, but it was faster on the upper end, but the people on the lower end were growing faster than any other lower classes in the other countries, would you be happy with that or not? So I'm not uh, Joseph Stiglitz or <laughs> Tomas Piketty. And so I'm really, I, I mean, I don't pretend to be expert enough to um, debate which deciles ought to uh, accelerate uh, income the fastest. But what I will say is that I heard a CEO recently say that the, the, uh, the solution for inequality was growth, that we just needed to focus on growth. And, and we have had growth, actually, these past two decades. The economy in this country has grown over those two decades at very impressive rates in terms of our history, in spite of the fact that we had uh, the downturn and the terrible uh, market and the, and the af aftermath of that. We have had growth. We have had productivity gains over the past two decades that we have not had since the Industrial Revolution. The problem is the prosperity, the, the aggregated uh, wealth of that has not inured in a broad way in our society. It's inured to those of us, including me, at the top of the distribution <clears throat> in a way that it's been asymmetrical with our history. Because in American history, the idea, certainly in our modern history since the Second World War, our idea of prosperity was a shared prosperity. And so you would see distribution across the income spectrum in a way that meant that there was just a, a larger number of votes being lifted. And we haven't had that these past two decades. And, and I don't think simply saying we need more growth, we do need growth, but that's insufficient. Or saying we just need to focus on education. If we just focus on education, that will solve inequality. Focusing on education, which we must do, without focusing on some of the underlying structural barriers to opportunity and to the mobility escalator, we have to also focus on mobility. And if we don't look at both of those dimensions and simply think, because it's more comforting to say, let's just focus on education. That, again, is one of those generosity things. Right. It makes us all feel comfortable. There's nothing threatening about it. It works with our narrative. But when you say, we have to focus on mobility, we have to figure out how we get more people on that mobility escalator and have them riding it faster, higher, sooner, that's a harder conversation. Right, right. Yeah, um, right here. Yeah. Air's coming at you. We'll do a couple more. <laughs> Hi, my name's Rachel Goslins. Um, hey, Rachel. I'm curious, as a uh, Philanthropy, which has been somewhat static in its models and its strategies for many, many decades, in the past decades has seen the evolution of new um, strategies and models. You have things like venture, venture philanthropy and impact investing. Uh, on one hand, you have new vehicles like B Corps and things that uh, in the past would have been uh, foundations and are now LLCs. What do you think are the most promising and or threatening trends in kind of philanthropy these days? So I think the, uh, a promising trend, for example, uh, I think what Mark and Priscilla did with the Zuckerberg, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, as they're calling yeah. it, is, is a remarkable thing. Um, I think uh, setting up an LLC, not taking the route of a big tax write-off and setting up a private foundation, um, was a brilliant move and in some ways is a recognition that what they want to achieve, what they're working on, which are really tough issues, criminal justice reform, immigration reform, racial justice. I mean, these are things that a lot of philanthropists aren't really comfortable working on, that they need all the tools in their toolbox that they can deploy. Uh, 
to address those issues. And being a private foundation, they can't lobby. They, there are things that you simply can't do when you are a private foundation. So the fact that they've set up an LLC, I think, is, is fantastic. And I think as we move in that direction, um, I think it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's, we should be celebrating that. And I think, unfortunately, um, as we've seen in the aftermath of their announcement, there's been a lot of blowback, a lot of negative press about their, uh, their gift. Um, part of it, I think, actually is, is in, in some ways manifestation of this inequality, where there is, where there is just suspicion. I mean, so there was the, the, the Times piece where the entire theme of it was that there's something nefarious going on here. Um, someone with this much money, is this a tax dodge? Is this some effort to shelter income? Is this, there was all these other reasons attributed to, the, I think in some ways that cynicism about wealth and concentrated wealth reflects something broader going on in our society that in some ways is like what we saw in the early 20th century. Remember, John D. Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Foundation, you know, the seal says, founded in 1913. John D. Rockefeller filed his charter, his lawyers filed the charter in 1908. Congress, upon receiving his charter, refused to authorize his giving away his money for charity because there is such a mood in the public that there is nothing good that could come of John D. Rockefeller's money. And, and so Congress actually, for five years, he paid lobbyists and lawyers, tried to get, did all sorts of things, and was unsuccessful, and finally gave up. And as his friend Andrew Carnegie did, went to the state legislature in Albany. And that's why the Rockefeller Foundation took five years. The same kind of cynicism that you, we, you're reading about this Zuckerberg gift, some of those same themes are present. The last thing I will say is, in terms of trends that I think are worrisome, it is when very successful people who have been very successful in finance decide that they are going to solve a major social challenge, public education, for example, and say, well, because I was successful building this hedge fund, I can solve public education, too. <laughs> and, and so actually, actually craft a strategy for a public education reform for an entire state or an entire school district, and actually think that with, at, so the lesson from John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie is that John D. Rockefeller understood how to extract and refine oil. He mastered that, and he made a fortune doing it. But he did not think that because he had done that, that he was qualified to solve public education. Mm -hmm. and, and he listened. I mean, when you read Rockefeller and Carnegie's uh, letters to even their children and their spouses, they're filled with inquiry. They're filled with, I, this is a problem. I'm not sure how we're going to solve, in the case of Rockefeller, I love his, his, his letters about uh, sanitation and all the problems with sanitation that we had in New York City. But it wasn't, you know, I'm, here's what we should do. It was, Let's find the best experts. Let's find the best people. Let's find people closest to the problem. And I want to bring them in. And I want to hear from them. And I want to get their advice. And I'm going to take their advice. Of course, I'm going to stick with my own sort of gut on a lot of things. But I think one of the trends that we see that is very problematic is the idea that these new philanthropists, some of them, and I'm generalizing because there is Tremendous variation, and there, is, there are many, many people who are thoughtful and who are, who are very good listeners. But one of the challenges today, which is, again, I hate to keep beating a dead horse, but in our increasingly unequal society, if you are privileged, 
it is harder to, to hear no. <laughs> it's harder to internalize because you don't have anyone saying to you, that's a stupid, stupid idea. idea. I mean, no, I mean, I, and I, I sat through a board, meeting, a, a board meeting recently of an organization that, you know, with people who are significant people and a significant person made a completely absurd and ignorant statement. And no one said anything. I mean, it <laughs> I was around the entire, I mean, no, it, was, it was stupid. I mean, it was just, it, I couldn't believe it. And, and there was no one who said, you know, perhaps what you meant, meant was, <laughs> or, and, and I, I just reflected on it after and I think, well, you know, he probably makes statements like that all the time. And nobody calls him. No one calls him on it because who would? Who would call him on it? So let me end by asking, what should the people in this room do if they want to make a difference? I think, first of all, the people in this room, who I know, so I mean, I will just simply say that if I could bottle the people in this room, <laughs> because I think in this room is the kind of civic spirit and the kind of commitment to making this city and our world a better and more just place. So I want to bottle <laughs> these people up and uh, manufacture them in large numbers and spread them around the world to make and a we'll big difference. And will be brought to scale. <laughs> Thank you, Darren. Yeah. Thank you. Walter. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Walter. Bravo.